Cool. Well, I'm the ring-in preacher tonight because uh, Levi, one of his children, was unwell, spent the night in hospital, one of our grandkids. So Pastor Levi is not with us tonight. Uh, but Goldie is good. She's good. She's home. She's doing well. So everything's good. But it means that I got roped into doing this. I got roped into talking to the young people. I love that. They don't let me do it anymore. You realise that? Like, it's like I offer all the time. I'm like, gee, I'm happy to come and speak for you. And they're like, we know you are. <laughs> That's the end of the conversation. And then, uh, then when someone goes to hospital, it's like, would you come? <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah, I know. You need me still, just. We're in a, we've been in our uh, Easter series. And uh, I guess that's, that's been about the lead up to this weekend. We've looked at... Um, uh, over the last few weeks, and I think Levi's been tracking at night. I've been to a few of the night services where you've sort of been tracking this way too with this journey towards the cross. And of course, today's Resurrection Sunday. Uh, and that's where the story turns. You know, I mean, it's, you've got to admit, it's a hard story to look at before that. If you're really, really honest and you're actually reading the Bible and, and paying some attention, it's not easy to look at. It's a difficult story. And then, of course, today, everything changes. We celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And because of that, um, as we've been singing, song after song has talked about because he lives, we live also. Um, because uh, in, in that sense that he conquered death and then forgives us so that sin does not have power over us and the power of death is sin. So if sin doesn't have a hold on you, death can't have a hold on you and we have a promise of life. And it's eternal life, not just sometime in the future, but it can begin right now by breaking the shackles and the chains and the things that hold us down and sometimes cause us to look a little bit less than fully human. We're made in the image of God to reflect the image of God. And, uh, and when we sort of stray away from that, we begin to look just a little bit less than what we were designed and created to look like. So here we are tonight. Levi did a survey. survey. Now, he gave me his notes. You know, he, he was like, I'll give you my notes. I did a questionnaire. Some of you guys filled out some answers and responses. And uh, I'm going to give you all the notes and you can just preach my notes, right? So I got them at like 2 o'clock. And the only problem is his notes were garbage. Hey? Like, <laughs> now, don't, t- don't tell him I said that. No, it's not true. He actually had a really good concept and I didn't want to steal it off him. So I just stole one point off him, okay? But I'm going to use his survey results and he might use them again next week too. He asked a couple of questions and I'm not sure who answered this, but can I just say, you know, young adults community of, uh, of New Hope Church, I'm really concerned about some of you guys. <laughs> some of the answers are here. So here we go. Have you ever lost something and found it in a strange or obvious place? Yes. I can tell some of the people have obviously answered the question already. My glasses, they were on my head. Now, come on, who has actually done that? Four, five, how many? Everyone else has never worn a set of glasses, I'm convinced of that. Uh, Yes, lost my keys for six months, found in gumboots, top top shelf. (laughs) I remember losing a childhood teddy bear and finding him in a box that I must have put him in, if that kind of answers the question. It's like, yes, it kind of does. Here's a beauty. This, this one cracked me up. Don't admit this if this was you. Please don't. This is the story of when I lost my first tooth and didn't know it. Ha ha. So I was at the grocery store and my brother and I got those toys out of the coin machine while my mum was checking out at the checkout. The lids were hard to get off and I used my teeth. I didn't even have a loose tooth or anything. I got it opened and was looking at the ground and saw something that looked like a tooth. (laughs) I picked it up, held it out to my brother and was like, look, it's like a tooth. And he looks at me and starts screaming to our mum. Turns out there was blood streaming from my mouth and it was actually my tooth, lol. (laughs) That's funny. I lost an apple. But it's okay, I found it in the bottom of my work bag three months later. (laughs) 
And then someone just said, always, wallet, keys, my own flipping car at Grandy one time. And I'm like, <laughs> that's hilarious. Okay, second question. Who, does anyone want to, <laughs> should we continue with the survey? Second question was, have you found something in Jesus that you couldn't find outside of him? Which I thought was a great question. Um, probably the biggest thing would be security. These are the answers. Just being able to move forward no matter what's happening around me or how uncertain things feel. But that's a good answer. That's cool. Anyone else found that? I'd, I'd have to say that resonates with me. Peace in difficult financial situations. That resonates with me. Maybe I just find myself in trouble all the time. I found joy when I started to get to know Jesus. Before understanding what he did for me on the cross, I was really sad and angry all the time. I barely smiled, and now I smile all the time, even when things aren't great or easy, because I have joy in the fact that I'm not alone in it. What a brilliant answer. Uh, for sure, feeling secure and confident, feeling in control as well. Contentment, a deeper reason to wake up, a desire to grow because I know my life matters, security in the way he accepted and continues to accept me wherever I am and take me on a journey. That's brilliant, eh? Um, I found, does, it, does this resonate? Some of these resonate with some of us? Yeah. I found recently that I'm loved by Jesus, even if I didn't believe it to be true. But I do know now that I'm loved by Jesus and, and he has created me for a purpose. And I can confidently say that I'm proud of how far I have come. And I owe a lot of that to my trust in Jesus. And I'm like, they're just such beautiful testimonies, eh? I was lost, but I found peace and purpose in Jesus. Simple testimony like that. So, I mean, they're, they're just telling answers. And they certainly resonate with me, obviously resonate with a few people. Maybe if you've walked with Jesus for a while, you've probably experienced at least one or two of those. Uh, that is kind of what Jesus does. And so I want to look at tonight's message is called The Kingdom Is. That's our theme for the year. It's life, part two, because this morning was part one. The kingdom is life, okay? And we're going to look at the resurrection of Christ. So I want to read from Luke chapter 24, eight verses. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, and this is talking about, I guess, this morning back in history, okay? The woman took some spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They were going to anoint the body. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus, now, while they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? Now, there's a whole message there, isn't it? If you think about it, why do you look for the living among the dead? We are always looking for life in the wrong places he was not there he has risen he is not here sorry he has risen remember how he told you while he was still in galilee the son of man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners be crucified and on the third day be raised again then they remembered his words talking about jesus words that he had spoken to them and so right here we have this um angelic appearance of these people in the tomb, mysterious people that give them a message from God, remind them what Jesus has said to them. And, uh, and I just want to take a few thoughts from these real quick. And as we go, so I'm going to get the ball rolling. I'm wondering if we get a little bit interactive by point two. Are you up for that? Okay. So here's the first thought. They did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. We sometimes look for the wrong things in the right places if you think about it we look for the wrong things in the right places they were in the right place to find a corpse if they were looking for a body they were in the right place the question is should they have been looking for a body Jesus had said to them I will rise on the third day he had told them that so they're actually in the right place looking for the wrong thing have you ever been there? You know you're kind of in the right place, but then you maybe sometimes only in retrospect realise I was looking 
for the wrong thing. My expectation was not necessarily helpful. Um, so it, when I look at this in the faith community of the church, I'm just thinking about this this afternoon. I think everything I'm about to mention, you will be able to find the following in the church. You should be able to find the following in the church. But only if you're actually looking at it the right way, which actually equals asking the right questions. In a sense, they were asking the wrong question, where's the body? That's the wrong question. They should have been saying, where is the risen Christ? So they had the wrong question and they didn't find what they were looking for. So when I think about the church, I think about our lives, I've seen this play out again and again and again. Friendship. Surely you can find friendship in the community of faith. I mean, I think you should be able to find that in the church. All of these things I'm about to mention, they're not bad things. Um, the church is the right place to find them, I believe, in so many ways. However, often we're asking ourselves the wrong question. The wrong question is, who will be my friend? If you're looking for friends in the church, it's a wrong expectation. The Bible actually says he who would have friends must show himself friendly. The right question is, who can I be a friend to? So we can be looking for the, right thing, the, 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 the wrong thing with the wrong expectation in the right place where you could possibly find it and totally miss it because we're asking yourself the wrong question. We're actually looking for the wrong thing even though we're in the right place. And people get upset, people fall out of community, people walk away from churches at times going, well, I, I couldn't find a friend there and they weren't very accepting. And it's like, my thought is always how accepting and friendly were you? I tend to think that people that are friendly, accepting, find friends pretty quickly, generally. You know, we might be shy or whatever, but uh, hell me down if I'm not being, being truthful. Another one is relationships. And I guess I could talk here about uh, boy-girl relationships. We've just done a relationship series. So the boy-girl relationship. You should be able to find a great relationship in the local church. I did. I did. Uh, but it probably never really got working until I started thinking about who I was, not about who should be loving me. It's a really funny thing in relationships. We, people start out, I see this in marriage counselling all the time, so advice for you in the future if you're not yet married. People always start out looking for someone they can love. But then if they don't grow up and mature in that relationship, they end up asking the question, who's loving me? It's like, no, that's not how you started this. You started going, oh God, all I want is someone to love. And now you're saying, all I want is someone to love me. If, if, if you stick with part A, you'll be fine. I'm so grateful I get to love my wife. I'm grateful for that. And at times, is there tensions because I don't feel like I'm getting receiving the same degree of love back? Absolutely. Do you think she has those tensions? Absolutely. But if you, as long as you just keep asking yourself the right question, you will actually find the right thing in the right place. Ask yourself the wrong question and you will actually miss, you'll be in the right place. I've seen this with people with marriages, they're in the right marriage, but they somehow convince themselves they're not. And again, they're asking themselves the wrong questions. Here's another thing, acceptance. Do you think we should find acceptance in the church? It's a good place to find it. But the, the wrong question to be asking is, where can I find acceptance? Actually, the right question is, uh, how can I contribute to creating a place of acceptance? It sort of comes back to me every time. I was meant to get you to answer that one. Here, I'll give you a go at this one. You ready? Encouragement. What's the wrong question to ask when it comes to, I need encouragement? Yep, a couple of people have got it, but no one's game to say it. Someone else out loud? Yeah, that's the right question. Yeah, yeah. So the wrong question is, who's going to encourage me? The right question is, who can I encourage? Again, you sow and then you reap. This is a principle in all creation. The farmer does not buy a new block of dirt, plough it, not sow it, 
and then go back six months later and be disappointed he doesn't have corn. He doesn't do that. He plows it and he does, works the soil. He does all of that. When it rains on time, he sows the seed and then he goes back in three to six months looking for a harvest. So sowing always comes before reaping. And this will sort of broaden out as we get a little bit further into this sort of message. So when I look at that, if you look at everything I just looked at, friendship, relationship, acceptance, encouragement, um, all the part A answers are corpses. By that I mean they belong to death. What's in it for me? is death to us. Sin is selfishness. Sin is introversion. Sin is, this is all about me. And when we do that, we always take from others. And we stop being a life-giving spirit. We stop being a river that blessing flows through and we become a stagnant pond and then wonder why we don't feel good. Because we're actually created to reflect the image of God and God continuously gives. Continuously gives out. So all of those part A answers are like, they're part of the cycle of death. Me, me, me. This is just acting like the man, the woman of dust rather than the new creation that we're meant to be. Remember, Jesus said, if you lose your life, you'll find it. That's, that's the new creation order. It's sort of like a paradox. Hey, lose your life, you'll find it. Lose your life for my sake, Jesus said, and for the kingdom, and you will find it. But everything in our world is trying to push us back to the dust. It's all about you, your needs, instead of why not find a place where you can sow? And what you sow, so shall you reap, is what Paul teaches. And so you need friendship, you sow into friendship. But not with this motive of they better give back. That's not sowing, that's putting your seed in and keeping your hand on it so you can pull it back out if you need to. Sowing means you let it go. And not every seed, not every seed a farmer plants will actually bear fruit. Not every seed grows. Some seed just dies in the ground. Some seed, birds of the air take it. Not every seed of friendship you give will be reciprocated. And that's why it's so important to just keep sowing. He who sows much seed shall come with his sheaths rejoicing. So, um, you okay? Okay. Does that make sense? So we're here, we're in the tomb, we're, we're talking about resurrection principles and I'm talking about new creation. New creation's thinking different. It's asking different questions. That's one of the things Jesus does in our heart. He switches us on to a different way of viewing the world. Here's the second thought. Why do you look for the living among the dead? I've already mentioned it. We often look for the right thing in the wrong place. So just flipping this, we look for the living among the dead. So they were looking actually for the right thing, but in the wrong place, in a sort of a paradox, if I can flip that. So do you want to get a little bit interactive here with some guesses? Okay, and I thought this would be the easy one because we've all, we've all at some point been looking for things that are good, that are right, that we think will give us life, but we're looking in all the wrong places. That's just common to man. And when I say man, that's mankind, humankind, if uh, you need a better word. So what are some things? What are some things that we might, what, what are some things we look for in the wrong places at times? Anyone game enough to? Validation. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, if you, here's the interesting thing. Can I take it from there, Nick? And I'll run with these thoughts. So, and, and some of them might be in my notes, I hope. <laughs> But this is what, this is honestly what I've seen unfold. And this is just good, good, I guess, insight and advice. That if you don't receive your primary validation from your heavenly father, no human being on the planet will be able to give you enough. No matter how many gifts, no matter how many words, no matter how much time, it will never be enough for you. And what's interesting, if we look at the life of our Lord Jesus Christ, before he worked one miracle, before he did a thing at his baptism, his Father in heaven spoke and said, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. After that, he was tempted, returned in the power of the Spirit and began doing miracles. So Jesus was affirmed before he did a thing. 
So many people are trying to do things to earn affirmation. But the only place to get genuine, authentic affirmation is from your heavenly Father. And at that point, you cease from fighting for approval. And you know you're approved and you begin to relax around people. And what I've found is life just begins to flow. But so many people, have you ever met someone who's just so insecure? They're always bragging it up. They're always telling stories you can't believe. It's because they don't have that sense of affirmation that can only come from their heavenly father. They're looking for that approval. So that's so true. What's, uh, what's something else that we can, you know, it's kind of the right thing. So God wants to affirm us, but we'll never find it in our world. You know, if you get people who are top of the sporting game, top of the music industry, top of the acting, most often their lives end up crashing and burning at some point. No matter how successful you are, you can't outrun your humanity. You just can't. You've got to come to a place of peace with it through God. So thanks, Nick. Anyone else? Just a, a thought. Identity. Well, there's a huge one, isn't it? I mean, that's kind of the buzzword of our age. The further, I'm, I'm, for me, interestingly, the further we've moved away as a society in large from accepting the fact that we are created in the image of God, the further our society moves away from that, the greater the confusion issues have become in our society over identity. So to me, that, those two things correlate, sadly correlate. And God is desperately wanting to affirm people. We are created in the image of God. And he's wanting to affirm that in people. But as our society rejects that, it's paying a huge price. Maybe some of us have, have felt that or are feeling the burn of that moving away from the identity we were created to have. I just want to encourage you, you know, God is the one who gives you identity. God is the one that gives you affirmation. Don't look for that stuff in the wrong places. It will only add to your pain. So that's a huge one, Sarah. Uh, we got time for one more, real quick. Neither of those are in my notes, so this is awesome. <clears throat> Sorry? Exactly. That was in my notes, actually. Yeah, exactly right. So, you know, our world offers us a smorgasbord of this will make you feel better. Everything from new technology to dating apps to whatever it might be, pornography, whatever is out there. Eat yourself to death if you want to. Take this drug. It'll make you feel better. So our world is saying all these pleasurable things. And to experience pleasure is good. God experiences pleasure. So pleasure in itself is not bad. We are created in the image of God. Therefore, we are created to experience pleasure. But it's one of those things that our world offers freely. But you've got to be very, very careful that you don't receive your pleasure from the wrong place. Otherwise, it always ends up taking from you once again. And... Um, when I think about that, you know, pleasure, I guess my, my note simply was <coughs> we're always tempted with immediate gratification over long-term investment. You know what I mean? It's always like, oh, this is easy. You can just get it like that. And there's just something that doesn't last about that. Whereas long-term investment, whether it's in a relationship or whatever it might be, long-term investment pays off. It's like our world's got this whole big get rich, get rich quick scheme running when it comes to money and pleasure. But actually it's long-term steady investment that builds, whether it's a relationship or whether it's your finances or whatever it might be. That's actually the track that most people go forward on. Does that make sense? And so I just think about it like um, the Gadarene demoniac is what I thought about as an example with this. Um, he was a crazy guy that lived in the tombs, cried out, cut himself. Bible says he was demon possessed and that Jesus, you know, literally delivered him of just a ton of demonic activity. Demons come flying out of him. Pigs went screaming down and baptized themselves. All kinds of things happened around that. But here's the thought. You know, when we talk about these things, if you're going to the tombs, you might be looking for the right thing. They were looking for Jesus but they went to the tombs in one sense. Um, uh, if you're going to the tombs, just you, you will end up driving yourself crazy. 
you'll go crazy looking for the right stuff in the wrong place. And I mean, for me, I thank God, I, I think I'd worked it out at 21, but it did take me till 21. But I kind of worked it out that everything that I thought was actually feeding me and fun and doing something for me, after about seven years of that, I realised it was taking. 14, I sort of broke the shackles of my parents. 15, got an apprenticeship, lived in the world of men in the, mo in the motor industry and just went rank for seven years. And it got to the point where I thought, I thought I was doing this because it was fun. But all it's done is take, 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 and diminished my humanity. Hasn't added to my humanity like it promised it would. Has anyone else had that experience, just being honest? Okay, last spot. Have we got time for one more thought, real quick? It has to be quick. Okay. It says, then they remembered Jesus' words. So the angel sort of reminds them and and it jogs in their memory. That's right. That's what Jesus said. Interestingly, within hours, Jesus is re revealing himself to them and to others. Within hours, Jesus is found in that sense. They've actually found him and he's presenting himself to them face to face alive. And I guess this whole thought is life is found in Jesus' words. Again, as I said before, lose your life, you'll find it. That is such a paradox. That is so contrary to the person of dust. But it is the person of new creation that actually goes, yeah, this world doesn't work the way it looks like it does. It actually is flipped on its head. So if, again, as I give myself away, I actually find life. Now, even secular um, so, so, sociological studies are showing us now the value of volunteering. No one can argue with the studies they've done on this stuff. Jesus was saying it 2,000 years ago. Just give yourself away to someone else and it will actually increase your life. And so we know these things. Uh, think of other things Jesus said, life found in his words. The first shall be last <laughs> and the last shall be first. So Jesus said basically, and he was talking about his kingdom, those that push to the front of the line greedily, push other people out of the way, climb over other people, They'll actually be, they'll come in last. They might appear like they're coming in first. Come on, have you ever thought there's someone who doesn't do any, doesn't live in any godly way and yet they seem to be ahead of me? This is one of those things in, in scriptures that addresses it again and again and again. Why do, why do people that, you know, are, are basically flaunting every principle we could talk about, why do they seem to prosper? But Jesus is like, you know, they, they actually aren't. There's one big problem with win winning the rat race. You've got to be a rat to win it. That's the problem with it. And as Jesus said, what, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and to actually lose his soul or to lose his identity in the process? And so these are things that, again, life is found in Jesus' words. Want to be great? Want to be great? Learn to be the servant of all. It's like a paradox, isn't it? It's like, hey, hang on a sec. No, but I want position. I want to be recognised. I want to be validated. And Jesus is like, Jesus wasn't saying, oh, no, I don't want that for you. He was showing us how to do it. He was saying, yeah, you want to be, you, you want to be great. You want to be validated. You want to be worthwhile. You want your life to have an impact. So do I. Here's the way you do it. It's not the way you think. <laughs> it's, it's not by lording it over others. It's not by winning the rat race. It's actually by serving others and you will discover greatness. So there's life in Jesus' words. Um, all of these words belong to the new creation. They don't make sense to the man of dust in that sense. Uh, and I think that's why we need to be reminded because these things slip to the peripheral. Come on, does that happen to you? You can't, kind of, you might hear a message and you sort of agree and yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it's, it's a message like tonight that's a reminder where you might think, oh, Actually, I, I, I used to be convinced of that, but maybe I've now moved off centre just a bit and started to drift. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, and then I'm just going to ask us a couple of questions. It says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if you're a believer, if you've put your faith and your confidence in Jesus, the new creation has come, the old has gone, 
the new is here. We could talk about that. The old way of finding pleasure. The old way of being affirmed. The old way. Every, every example we just looked at, you could say the old way is gone. There's a new way to do it all. So here's our questions. Um, and I'm asking them personally. And I'm asking myself at the same time, but I want to I use these, um, these words. Are you looking for the wrong things here? Even here in church, just right here in the PM service. Is your expectation even wrong? I, I don't know why people are here. I just want to help you. Because if you get your expectation right, you will actually find joy. You will find satisfaction. You will find what you're looking for. Jesus said, ask, seek, knock, and the door will be open to you. So the first thing we need to really get, get right is, what am I looking for? So I just ask that question. Please, I'm not trying to make anyone feel unwelcome. I'm just saying that would pay for all of us to sort of search our heart and think, what am I, what am I here for? What am I actually looking for here? What's my expectation? Second question is, are you looking for the right things in the wrong places? As I spoke and we spoke about that and we talked about pleasure and different things, am I looking for things that they might be good things but I'm looking to fulfill them in the wrong way, in the wrong place? It's a great question to ask ourselves, and again Jesus would call his resurrection power would call us out of the old into the new out of the old man into the new creation saying come on same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you Paul says in Romans 8 if the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal body by his spirit and that's what God's got for us. And lastly, what does Jesus have to say about your situation? You know, I'm, I'm convinced, I mean, the Bible's a big book. I think we've got to be careful sometimes we don't just find in it what we want to find in it. But what I've found is if I'm genuinely seeking God for answers, and the only way I can do that is I'm, I'm happy to hear an answer I might not like. <laughs> That's, that means I'm open to hearing anything. At that point, I think God can speak to any one of us about any facet of our life He needs to. Any facet we seek Him on. If we are open-hearted by His Spirit, Christ can speak to you through Scripture or in prayer directly into your heart. He can speak to you about what you face. And I just want to encourage you, you know, if you're facing any sort of particular situation, if you're wrestling with anything, Find out what Jesus says about it because there's always life in Jesus' words. There's always life in Jesus' words. And sometimes it's so counterintuitive. You think, oh my goodness, Lord, no, you couldn't be asking that. But if you can just be obedient, on the other side of obedience, you find blessing. And you think, wow, God, thank you for leading me through my own fear and my own doubt. Thank you for giving me the faith to trust you because now I see the fruit of trusting you. And that's the resurrection life of Jesus at work in us. That's how it works. One obedient step and Jesus meets us on the other side of our fear and of our doubt. So I'd love to pray for us tonight if I could. Um, just before I hand back to whoever, Sarah, um, could we? Could I pray? For, could I pray for you tonight? Is that okay? Could we just bow our heads for a moment? Let's just just give God a moment. And um, and Lord, I just pray for anyone whose heart's been stirred by that, whose heart's been challenged by it, whose heart's been encouraged by it. I thank you, Father, that by your Spirit you just empower your Word in each one of our hearts, each one of our minds this, this week. Let this week be a week where we determine at, at every decision point we come to that we are going to live as new creation people. We're not going to live just as people of the dust, but we're going to live as people that you have called 
to be heavenly minded, Christ centred. Lord Jesus, we want to trust you every step of the way. While our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. If you're here tonight and maybe you've never just put your faith in Jesus Christ, I want to give you the opportunity to do that just before we close. So just while, while all the heads are, are bowed now, eyes are closed, Friend, if, if that's you, I'd love to know who I'm praying with. I'm going to pray a prayer. I'm not going to embarrass you. But if you're here tonight and you've never taken that step of faith, you know, stepping over your fears, stepping over your doubts and putting your trust in Jesus, I want to encourage you to do it tonight. And if that's you, would you just raise your hand? I'll acknowledge it. You can put it down again. And I'm just going to pray one more time. Yeah, God bless you, mate. That's awesome. Others here in this place, just real quick, just real quick. I don't know everyone here, so I want to make sure I give you the opportunity to do this. Well, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. So Heavenly Father, we just thank you for people that are opening their heart right now to you. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would make yourself so wonderfully real and powerful to them. Touch their lives. And let them know your reality, your goodness, as they move forward in life. In Jesus' name, amen.